Okay, hello, welcome. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about um, processes and about some of the stuff in Chapter 2, and but specifically mostly about the second program assignment. Um, so one of the big things in that, sorry, in Chapter 3. So one of the big things in Chapter 3 about processes were uh, talking about uh, this idea of process states and also about some of the um, operating system structures that were needed to um, implement multi-programming. So one of the things about process states is basically they support the idea of the implementation of multi-programming. Um, the book talked about five and seven state uh, diagrams. So in, in our um, second uh, programming assignment, we're basically going to be concentrating on the, the, the most important, the main kind of three process states, the, the ready, running, and blocked states. So, you know, specifically, um, having a difference between a ready state and a block state is what allows for a, an operating system to implement processes and to implement the idea of multi-programming so that when one process is blocked, uh, we can select another process that's ready to run and let it run for a bit, okay? So anyway, this, this is kind of our, our, our basic thing that we're going to be implementing in a Programming Assignment 2. So, so you need, for Programming Assignment 2, you need to create um, a basic process control block. You need to simulate processes running in your system. And your processes are going to be in, in these states mostly. You either ready, you know, waiting to run, they're ready, uh, or they're, maybe they're blocked, waiting on something, or one process at a time is going to be running. So we're going to be simulating a single CPU system. And we're going to be simulating uh, a system that implements a round-robin scheduler. So basically, uh, we also have to implement um, the idea of time slice quantums, okay? So a process, when it, when it gets allocated the CPU to run for a bit, it will only run at most for its, its allocated time quantum. And if it exceeds its time quantum, then it will time out and be put back on the ready queue, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, when that happens, so whenever the, the process, be whenever the CPU becomes idle, um, there's, something has to happen so that the, uh, the uh, the operating system looks at the ready queue and, and selects the next process that's at the head of the ready queue and dispatches it to become the next running process, okay? So if you look at the assignment, uh, program assignment two, um, you'll see, I mean, these are the basic uh, events that happen in your simulation. So most of these, except for the CPU event, directly correspond to the state transitions in the um, um, that, 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 that process state diagram, okay? So, um, so if a new occurs, basically whenever a new occurs, you have to create uh, a new process and add it, to, uh, you know, a, create a process control block structure and add it to the list of running processes that the operating system is, managed, is managing. So then when you create a new process, um, it's going to start off, and then you're going to, it's going to start off in the ready state, and you're going to put it um, at the end of your ready queue, for example. Um, when a process is done, uh, whenever the simulation, a done, occur, a done event occurs in the simulation, if there's a process that's running, that process, you have to simulate it being finished, basically. So in that case, the process uh, just goes to like a done state, um, and, and you don't put it back on a ready queue or a blocked queue, it, um, um, it's just done. And at that point, you might, uh, you know, update some other information, you know, about how long the process ran and things like that. But, but basically, when it's done, you clean up the process, right? Um, and then wait and event basically control um, the, the, the simulation of a running event doing some sort of I.O., having to wait on input or output, okay? So if a wait event occurs, uh, the, the process that's currently running needs to be put into a block state, and you have to, maybe you'll have like a queue of, of processes that are blocked, and you would just put it on, on a queue or the appropriate queue of, of processes that are waiting on an event. Likewise, if the simulation receives that event, it has to check for processes that, that might have been waiting on that event and unblock them. So, so if a process becomes, if, if, it event, if its event occurs, the, any process waiting on that event should become unblocked um, and it should put back into a ready state and put, then be put back in the end of the ready queue, okay? So that, that's the basics of what you're asked to do in the, the second programming assignment, right? Um, and, uh, oh, and, and then, of course, one more thing. So the most complicated event is the CPU um, uh, event uh, here in the simulation, okay? So um, what should happen when, when, a, when you simulate a, a CPU cycle happening in the system, you're simulating that the running process 
if there is a running process currently on the system, um, runs for one time step, basically, okay? So, the, the pseudocode for what should happen when a CPU cycle occurs, so you should first check if, if the, the CPU is currently idle when, when a CPU cycle is being simulated, uh, that, that's, that's the point when you need to cause the dispatcher to run. So if the CPU is idle when, when the, the system is ready to run a CPU cycle, you want to run your dispatcher. And, and you know, the pseudocode for the dispatcher is see if there's any processes on the ready queue. The ready queue could be, at, could be empty, in which case the dispatcher can't do anything. No, nothing can be um, allocated to the CPU. But if the, if the ready queue isn't empty, the dispatcher should take the, the next process off the head of the queue, make it become the current running process, and, and of course remove it from the ready queue, okay? So, um, so after you check if the CPU is idle, uh, and, and possibly dispatch a process, allocate the CPU, you need to actually simulate running the, the, the current process for one CPU cycle. So again, I mean, even after you dispatch, I mean, the, the ready queue could have been empty, so I mean, the, the CPU could have no process to run, in which case, you know, the, C, the, the CPU is just idle for one time step. But if there is a process running, you basically simulate it doing some work by incrementing some counters in the process control block. So you'll, you'll, you'll need to keep track of maybe the total time that the process has been running, but you definitely need to keep track of how many steps in the current time quantum the process has been running, okay? Because then, then the, the last thing you should do when you're simulating a CPU cycle is you should, you should check if the, the current running process, if there is a process running, if it's exceeded its time slice quantum. And if it has, then you should time out the process. So in that case, um, you would cause the process uh, to go back into a ready state um, and you would turn, return it back to the end of the ready queue, okay? So that, that's the basics of, um, you know, what you're going to be implementing in um, the programming assignment two. So the, these simulation files, again, like, like in the warm-up program one, uh, the, what I do, what I test your programs with is I just give you a, a plain text file of these input events and, you, and I already give you the, the code to open the file and, and read the, the simulation file. So you read these in one by one. You know, so the very first thing in the simulation is to create a new process, right? And then after that, three CPU cycles. So basically what should happen here is new process should be created. You should start off with, with using a process identifier of one for the first process. And then the second process that's created in your system would get a process ID of two and then so on. Um, and then three CPU cycles happen. So when, it, when the new pr process one is created, it, it put, it's put on to the ready queue. And at this point, there's only one process on the ready queue. Uh, and then when the first CPU cycle happens, the, the CPU is idle. So that, pro that, that process is going to be taken off the ready queue and allocated to CPU, and it's going to run for one, two, three time steps, okay? And then so on. So if you look at the example output results, you should see that happening. So basically, you only output uh, this output every time a CPU, a simulated CPU cycle happens um, in, on, on the system, okay? So this time step one was a result of, of what the, the, the state of the system looked like, looked like after the, the, the first simulated CPU cycle, all right? So in this case, remember, uh, this is um, the, the output for that same input that we were showing um, in this uh, description for our second programming assignment. So in that case, after one time step, um, there, there's one process in the system. It, it was assigned a process ID of one. Um, it initially started off in a ready state. It was on the, the ready queue. But um, uh, for, for our first CPU cycle, it got dispatched. So it, 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 it was allocated the CPU. It ran for one, so it, it, it was put in the running state. Um, and um, in this output, I'm using slice to keep track of your time, your, your current time slice quantum, okay? So uh, process one started in the system at, at system time one, and, and after our first CPU cycle, it's used one of its five uh, time slice quantums, okay? So usually I'm using um, uh, five as the system time slice quantum here, okay? So that, that's another parameter that you have to pass in when you start running your program. I'll talk about that in a second, but, but for now, just, just keep in mind that the, 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 the time slice quantum that we're simulating is five time steps. So once you've done five time steps, you exceed your time slice quantum and you have to time out and be returned back to the ready queue. 
So if you remember, uh, three CPU cycles so all happen in this simulation. So basically this process runs one time, and then it runs the second time step, and this time slice quantum becomes two. And then the third time step is time slice quantum becomes three. Now remember, if I can go back up um, to my set of simulation steps, um, after the third CPU cycle, a new process was created, okay? And then, what, four more CPU cycles happen. So if you look after time step three in the simulation of the system, um, you'll see it broke across my page here, but you'll see that the process one is still running. You know, it, it hasn't timed out yet. But after time four, after the third time step, starting at time four, process two has entered the system. But it, it's, it's ready to run, but, it, but it's not running yet. So it's on the ready queue. So, so these things here that, that you're supposed to be outputting from your program represent which process is running on the CPU, there should only be one of these, but then these are the items that are on your ready queue, um, and if any items were blocked and, and waiting for some I.O., you would have uh, all the items that um, uh, are in the block stage and be shown here on your block queue, okay? So, so yeah, so at time step four, process uh, one is still running. It runs its fourth out of five time quantums, uh, and process two st is still there waiting. Then uh, another CPU cycle happens. So at this point, um, process five ran, runs its fifth uh, uh, time quantum. Um, and process two is still waiting, still on the ready queue. Um, so at, at this point, um, uh, process one actually exceeded its time slice quantum. So you don't, don't see the results till after this, but, but process one was done. So now at the next time step, what you'll see is that, uh, you know, so what happened at the end of time step five was that uh, process one was timed out and it was put back on the ready queue. So you'll see that at time six, process one is now at the, on the ready queue. It got put on the end of the ready queue. Uh, and then at time six, at the start of time step six, the CPU was idle. So the dispatcher ran. Process two was now at the head of the ready queue. So it got allocated the um, CPU and it ran for its first time slice, okay, and then so on. So now you'll see more cycles. Process two runs the second time slice. Then what happened here, if you go back and look at uh, at the uh, the simulation file, is that a wait event occurred. So this is our first example of the wait event. So after time seven, um, a, 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 a wait for event type one, whatever that. So imagine that that's maybe um, the process two did a read to a disk or something. So at that point, process two became blocked and was put on the blocked queue. The CPU became idle, and when there's only process one and two in the system, process one was on the ready queue. The CPU became idle because process two became blocked, so process one um, was uh, dispatched and started running again and so on, okay? So that's the basic thing, but you have to write code then basically to simulate that. And again, like the warm-up exercise, your program has to output exactly this, uh, you, you should try to output exactly uh, as close as possible you can this, this same output. So for every CPU cycle, you're outputting the system time, uh, what the current state of the CPU, you know, which process is running. The CPU can be idle. Um, I don't know if I showed that uh, in here, but um, uh, you know, so if it's not idle, you're going to see which process is running, um, the state of the process, you know, when it started. Uh, and then the, 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 the state of which processes are on the ready queue, which processes are on the blocked queue. Processes on the blocked queue, you want to indicate what they're waiting on, what event they're waiting on. All right? So that's the basics. Um, so, um, so I've, I'll just give you a few kind of examples maybe to help you get started here. Um, I've got, you know, uh, like I showed in, in the, the previous video about the program assignment, I, I've created, uh, I created an empty project, and then I added a source file, called my source file program02.cpp, and then I just copied in the, the program02.cpp um, um, starting template that I had, that, that I gave you. So at this point, you know, the, the only thing that I give you is a working main function. The main function is set up to parse the command line arguments. So uh, for, for the second program assignment, there's two command line arguments expected. The, the first command line argument is the name of a file that has the, the events that you're going to read in to, to do the simulation of your processes and the process states in the system. Uh, and the second parameter is going to be an integer, which is the time slice quantum to use, okay? 
and I usually use five uh, for the examples for, for the time slice quantums that we'll use in our system today. So, but anyway, the main function uh, uh, parses the, the command line options for you, um, and then it calls the run simulation function with the, the first command line argument, uh, which is the name of the simulation file, and then uh, with the second command line argument, which is the integer value of the uh, time slice quantum you're supposed to be using in your simulation, right? Um, and then, so again, if, if you look at um, the uh, run simulation, um, um, it's, it's just a pseudocode at the moment, so uh, I, I have the code in to open the file and read in the commands one by one from the simulation file. The only thing is, is none of these do anything yet, okay? So you have to fill in these parts. Um, so if you see a CPU, you have to simulate a single CPU cycle happening. If you see a new command, you have to create a new process and so on. But uh, the, 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 the template that I gave you should compile and run. So if you load this uh, and just do a build, build solution. Um, it should run cleanly. Um, and then if you, um, as I showed you before, uh, so it's still building here a little bit, so it succeeded. Uh, and then I showed you before, if you run it from the command line to give command line parameters, um, so in this case, um, uh, again, sorry, I've got my um, project in Visual Studio. Um, under um, projects, uh, under I called I called this project CSCI forty program zero two, and when I compiled it in debug mode, um, I had um, the, the dot exe under the, the debug subdirectory. Uh, notice I've already copied over to this. Uh, debug directory, the, the .sim files, okay? So it, if these are in the same file, in the same subdirectory, I should be able to run um, the executable, give it the simulation that I want to run. .sim is the file with, with the, the, the simulated command you're supposed to be running. And then the, the second command line argument um, is the time slice quantum, so I'll give it five. Um, so, and like I said, you know, you know it doesn't, the, the, the template that I gave you doesn't do anything. Um, uh, you have to do that, but but it does actually run. So you, you'll see the output here. It's, it's actually reading in the file uh, and, and going through, through the the, uh, the program. So in um, um, in the run simulation command, you know you have the file. You don't have, you don't have to use this. I open this up for you, um, and I read the, the lines one by one. But you also have the time slice quantum. You'll need to to use that to keep track of when a running process is expired, okay? So, uh, just real quickly, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to give you lots of hints, but, but just a few hints. Uh, so, I mean, you know, to start off with, um, you know, even if you don't get the whole program working, I mean, there are certain little things you can do uh, to get started. So, everybody should be able to simulate creating a new process in the system, okay? So, to do that, you need to, to have like a, a structure that represents a process control block that, that keeps track of the information for a single process. And then you probably have to have like a table, like maybe an array or something uh, to hold, uh, or you could use like a standard template library, a vector, you know, or something like that, a list, to hold all of the processes that you have on your system, okay? So, um, you know, so, so I might create a global, like just use a structure, um, I'll call it... Um, process control block, for example, all right? So, I mean, you know, you're going to have to, so at a minimum, you have to have the process identifier, okay? Uh, to, to get the output that I showed you that your program is supposed to be generating, you have to keep track of the start time, the system start time, okay? So that's another thing you need to keep track of. Uh, this could be a global, or this could be a variable you define in the uh, run simulation um, uh, um, uh, function. I'll just make a variable. So I'm trying to use, um, you know, a meaningful variable names here. Um, one thing I forgot to mention on the first video, that when, I, when I talked about meaningful variable names, that also applies to functions as well. So, so try and name both your variables, your functions. Also name classes and structures. Give them names that are meaningful. Don't use X, Y, or something like that. You know. So here, you know, my, my current system time is going to start off at 1 for the simulation, and this needs to be incremented. So every time I complete simulating a CPU cycle, I need to, to increment the current system time, the next time step. 
Um, so back to the process control block, you need uh, certain um, items like process identifier, you need to keep track of when the process started. Um, you're going to have to keep track of how many time slice quantums um, I've used so far, so, and when that reaches the, the, uh, the maximum time slice quantum, you have to time out the process when it's running. Um, and um, you probably need, oh, the process state is another big one. Um, I usually like to use like an enumerated type. Um, okay, so um, for example, you'll need state, you'll need ready, running, and blocked. One of the, um, um, you know, one of the um, coding style guidelines for a class, you should, things that represent constants, values that you can't change, should be in all uppercase. So usually a values in an enumerated type like this um, are constants. So I defined uh, four different states, re ready, running, blocked. I might need a fifth one um, done, like uh, for any process that it's done in the system, just for example. So basically what happens when I create a new process, um, I need to initialize these values, and whenever the process changes state, I, I need to, to change it to the appropriate value. It's currently running, or it's currently blocked, uh, oh, that, and that reminds me, so there's another thing I need to, to know what event, so if I am blocked, I need to keep track of which event um, I'm waiting on. So. Uh, you might need other things, but, but these are just an example of the things you would need in your process control block, okay? Um, so, you know, um, so, so like when you create a new one here, so I, I would write, I would actually write a separate function for each of these, okay? I won't do that here, but, but real quickly, um, oh, um, so another thing you might need, besides, also besides the current system time, keep track of the next process identifier, um, right? So if the first process is created, you should have a process ID of one, uh, and then you need to increment that, so the next time you get a new, um, you get the next process ID and so on, so forth, okay? So, um, so here, whenever I get a new event, I could do something like say, um, uh, create my new process, Right, so, so, I, so I'll just create a variable that this would allocate a new process. I'd have to initialize it, new process dot PID equals the, uh, the next process ID, for example. Um, remember to increment that, so the next time we do a new, we can assign the process ID of two. I don't know why it's complaining about that. We have this, the little squiggly line it means it thinks, uh, oh, next process, oh, I misspelled it, next process, capital I, capital D, there we go. Um, and then, you know, you need to initialize all the other things, um, so I won't show those, but, but uh, for example, the, the new process dot state starts off in a new state, for example, and so on, all right? There we go. Um, and then that's not all. So I mean, just as a final thing, you really need to have like um, like a list or something, or, or like an array. So I might have like an array um, um, of process control blocks. Again, I'm sure maybe a globals aren't a good way to go here. And, and I might want to actually do this as a class. You know, so, so this this cries out to, to do this as a class rather than a structure. So I can maybe add a constructor um, to, to initialize these, you know, a, a class constructor. But we might have something like a process control block. I might call it my, um, my process list. Um, um, and so one thing I mentioned in the description for this program, um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll have, I'll, you'll never have to simulate more than 100 processes running at a time. So I might just hard code it to have 100 processes. Okay, so I have my process list here. Um, so yeah, I mean, after I create my process back down here, you know, I, I need to, to keep track of that. So here we could use the process ID um, as an index in the process table. 
Um, so um, I called it uh, process. Min uh, I'm, I'm calling it process table here in my head. So maybe I should call it process table instead of process list. So process table. Um, so, but yeah. So anyway, it's like. Um, So here, you know, my process ID started as one. I increment it as now two here. Uh, you know, arrays in C are indexed by zero. So I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I might want to. Um, you know, up to you. I mean, you could just ignore index zero here. So, but. Um, So, but I did save the process ID of one into the PID for the new process I created. So I could use that as my index into my table, just as an example, like that. Okay. So, so that's the basics, um, and, and I'm mostly going to leave that there uh, for now. But, but that's how you create new. You know, so um, the, the the tougher one, of course, is, is is simulating the CPU cycle. You know, you have to do a couple steps. Uh, you have to keep track of whether what's running on the CPU or, or if it's idle or not. If it's idle, you need to run your dispatcher. Um, and if it's not idle, you need to simulate a time step. So simulate a time step is you need to increment whatever the current running process is. You need to run increment, uh, the, keeping track of how many time slice quantums it's used and that kind of stuff. And then you also have to check in a CPU cycle if the... Um, if it's exceeded the, the, the time size quantum setting for the system, you have to, to time out that process, return it back to the ready queue. All right, uh, that's it. I hope that gives you some good hints on how to get started. Um, uh, good luck.